A man who disbelieved the Christian story as fact, but continually fed on it as myth, would, perhaps, be more spiritually alive than one who assented and did not think much about it. This is Pints with Jack, Season 5, Episode 67. Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity. After Hours with Dr. Christopher Kazel and Dr. Matthew R. Petrusa. Good morning, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly favorite C.S. Lewis podcast, where together with Matt and Andrew, we break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. Now, as we wrap up the final month of this season of episodes, I wanted to talk about someone we've spoken about before on our various YouTube episodes, and that person is Jordan Peterson, the Canadian clinical psychologist, author, and speaker. So you might be wondering, why talk about him on a show devoted to the Inklings? Well, I'm sure I'm not the first person who's pointed out a certain quality to Dr. Peterson, which reminds them of a pre-conversion C.S. Lewis. Dr. Peterson speaks regularly about certain topics which were also important to Lewis. Uh, I mean, although the pre-conversion Lewis regarded myth as lies breathed through silver, Dr. Peterson sees them as vehicles of truth pregnant with meaning. And so in order to do a deep dive into the thought of Dr. Peterson, today we're going to be joined not by one, but by two guides. So don't be surprised if this episode runs a little longer than usual. And our guides today are two professors from Loyola Marymount University, Dr. Christopher Kazel and Dr. Matthew Petrusik. Dr. Christopher Kazel graduated from the Honours Programme of Boston College and earned a PhD four years later from the University of Notre Dame, and he's now Professor of Philosophy at Loyola Marymount University. He's written more than 100 scholarly articles and 16 books, and he's been appointed a corresponding member of the Pontifical Academy for Life. He is a consultant to the USCCB, and he is the William E. Simon Visiting Fellow in the James Madison Programme at Princeton University. And he's joined by Dr. Matthew R. Petrusik, who received an MA and PhD in Religious Ethics and is currently Associate Professor of Theological Ethics at Loyola Marymount University. He specializes in Christian ethics and moral theology and lectures broadly in English and Spanish on philosophy, theology, and the Catholic intellectual tradition. And together, both these men are fellows of the Word on Fire Institute, and together they have co-authored the book Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity, The Search for a Meaningful Life. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, David. Normally, I just have to introduce one person. I feel really tired at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for coming on the show to talk about the fascinating figure, which is Jordan Peterson. Now, I'm drinking some Earl Grey tea. Uh, you guys look like you're not drinking anything, so I will just say cheers. Cheers. <laughs> I, have this, cheers. I have this clear liquid, which I'm not going to disclose what it is. <laughs> yeah. it, it has a very potent smell. It could be that. water, but it could be something else, too. So I'm just not going to say. Are you in grading season at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. I need something very strong when it's grading season. That's for sure. I was going to say, I think it's probably just water. <laughs> <laughs> so let's begin by telling our listeners a little bit more about yourselves. And since we're Pints with Jack, if you also wouldn't mind mentioning what contact you've had with the works of Lewis and the Inklings. Uh, Dr. Kayser, if you'll go first. Sure. I first encountered uh, Lewis as an eighth grader, actually. I had a teacher give me a book uh, about called The Screwtape Letters, and I'd never read Lewis at all. And I read this book, and I was really quite intrigued by it. There was something about really the cast of mind that Lewis had that I found uh, quite remarkable. And then I didn't read any more Lewis until I got to college, and then I was fortunate to have uh, Dr. Peter Kraft at Boston College. And he mm -hmm. taught a course called Thinking About Religion. And in that course, he assigned two or three different books uh, by Lewis. And he is a great lover and exponent of Lewis's thought. So I really had a kind of deep dive with him. And so since then, I've really had uh, ongoing um, enjoyment and love for uh, Lewis's work. And so I would say every year I read at least a book by him or reread a book by him. And I've actually taught in class uh, a number of times, uh, mere Christianity. So yeah, I'd say I'm, I'm definitely a big Lewis fan. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Petrusek. Uh, I have to say my my own encounter with uh, Lewis is, is not quite as uh, impressive. Uh, it starts with the Tales, Tales of Narnia, which is a very good uh, series of books, by the way. Uh, when I was young, I did not have a, um, a very serious theological or philosophical uh, uh, education until I got into really into graduate school. 
And so one of, one of my joys has been to, to start getting into Lewis more uh, systematically uh, in, in more recent years. So, of course, mere Christianity has been a big part of that process. Hmm. Now, chances are that those who are listening to this podcast already have some idea as to who Jordan, Jordan Peterson is. Uh, but in case we have anyone who has no idea who we're talking about, uh, would you please explain who he is, why he's so popular, and anything in particular that you think people should know about him? Well, I think if you don't know who Jordan Peterson is right by this point, I'm not sure that you have uh, any intellectual interest at all because he's, <laughs> <laughs> I think he's at least one of the most prominent public intellectuals in the world. Uh, you know, his YouTube videos have been seen by uh, hundreds of millions of people. Uh, uh, times hundreds of millions of views, and he is, uh, you know, extremely well regarded as an author in terms of uh, book sales. So, if I'm not mistaken, Twelve Rules for Life sold more than six million copies and has been translated now into like more than ten different languages. And uh, Beyond Our Order was also a best selling book. So he's quite a prominent person. His background is in clinical psychology, but he's also done a lot of work in academic. Uh, psychology, but his interests really go beyond the psychological to uh, the religious, to the political. He has a great interest in uh, Russia, especially uh, the totalitarian regimes uh, of communism and also the Nazi uh, regime. So his his interests are quite uh, broad. And um, so, you know, that's sort of where he's coming from. My own interest in Peterson is especially focused on his take on religious matters, because I noticed that his uh, YouTube videos were seen by millions and millions of people. And if you go in the comments, many of the comments say things like this. Uh, I used to think the Bible was kind of just an old story and meaningless uh, recollections or fables by unlearned people. But now I can appreciate that the stories found in Genesis actually have deep meaning, a deep value, and really have abiding truths that can help us to lead a more meaningful and fulfilled life. And so when you have many atheists who are discovering the value and the depth of the scriptural stories, I thought that was quite intriguing. And so that really led me to study Peterson a lot more. Uh, I, I also uh, developed an in, in intellectual interest. Well, mine comes from, um, from a, a more theological uh, perspective and even more specifically in even uh, evangelizing perspective. I was going to say evangelical, but I mean, particularly from uh, speak within the Catholic tradition. Uh, I see, as, as Chris already noted, that, um, that Peterson has a particular, I would maybe even say uh, charism for speaking to people who are not only uh, suspicious about quote unquote religion in general and Christianity in particular, but hostile to it, that he is able to, to speak to them directly and while he may not be making converts, although there are some records of, of people converting to Christianity or to even specifically Catholicism because of their first encounters with uh, Peterson, he, he lowers people's guards in a way that I've just not seen any other uh, intellectual uh, able to do. And so um, that was one of the reasons I became very interested in him uh, early on, because that was quite apparent. I also have to say that I admire his, um, his courage. I think he he exhibits. Uh, maybe that's easier for him now that he is a uh, he he is who he is uh, intellectually and I imagine financially as well in terms of his book sales and everything else. But early on, he was just a a uh, a professor, a Canadian professor, a tenured professor, but a professor in uh, in higher education. Where speaking the way he speaks uh, is not only going to create. Um, a kerfuffle, it will make you real enemies who will be invested in seeking to remove you from your position. And he, he speaks the same way now that he did when he first uh, emerged on the scene. And so I, I really respect that. And in fact, um, I hope to emulate it in, in terms of, of the way that he speaks his understanding of what the truth is without fear. What is it, do you think, that makes him so popular and also able to connect with atheists and talk to them about the Bible in a way that they find engaging? Uh, I think part of the reason that he's engaging uh, for atheists is that he's approaching scripture in a way that doesn't presuppose faith. So he's looking at uh, many stories in Genesis as you might look at a play of Shakespeare and say, look, you know, maybe you don't believe any of this happened. Maybe you don't believe there was a Romeo and a Juliet. Well, okay, but let's think about what this story has to teach us. 
And I think any intelligent person who reads the plays of Shakespeare uh, would come away with the truth that this is unbelievably important, unbelievably meaningful, and it can teach us very, very important things about living a meaningful human life. And so I think, in a way, he's bracketing the question of, is this true in an historical sense, right? Was there an historical Adam? I think that's an interesting question. But he's saying, look, I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to get into, well, what is the story trying to teach us? And for instance, if you think about the story of Adam and Eve, again, approached in the sort of more literary way, he'd call it the psychological approach. Uh, the church fathers might call it the moral approach to scripture. These stories teach us a lot. Like just to give one example, when Genesis talks about Eve being created from the rib of Adam, uh, that is a very powerful way of talking about a, a reality that Thomas Aquinas described in the following way. He said, Eve was not made from the head of Adam to be his commander. Eve wasn't made from the foot of Adam to be his slave. Eve was made from the side of Adam to be his companion. So the Genesis story is telling us a very important truth that man and woman are not meant to be in an adversarial relationship. They're meant to be in companionship. They're meant to be in the covenant of marriage. And they're meant to be in a kind of harmony that arises because Adam and Eve ultimately are the same kind of being, right? They come from the same origin. They have the same substance, you might say. They share the same human nature. And so this is a very important truth. And if you look at other ancient stories, uh, some of these stories in the ancient world did not think about the relationship of man and woman in that sort of way. And so Genesis is really teaching us something important if we have eyes to, to see it. His professional background as well, I think, lowers uh, people's guards at, at the outset as well. So I'm speaking, I'm, I'm listening to a scientist speak right now. I'm listening to a, a doctor uh, speak right now. I'm listening to someone who represents the secular world speak to me right now. And so I think they're willing to uh, to to follow him down his his interpretations, with which do reveal these these truths within the Bible. Uh, in a way, with an open-mindedness that if if you're tagged as a as a religious person speaking to a non-religious person, then everything's going to be read through their their the their own ideological filters and biases and things like that. And so, in a sense, he has an advantage. Of course, he's immensely talented, but he also has an advantage from where he is in terms of his own professional background, his own his own uh, research and interests. Hmm. Now, since we're pints of the Jack, I obviously have an interest in Lewis. Do you have any idea how much Lewis Peterson has read? He's clearly read some. I've heard him refer to him from time to time. Uh, and particularly when he starts talking about myth, it sounds like the sort of thing that Lewis writes, but just a little bit further back in the conversion process. Yeah, I, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to exactly how much C.S. Lewis uh, Peterson has read. It's clear that he uh, understands something about Lewis's thought, but... I haven't, I don't recall him ever mentioning a specific book. Like I don't, no. I don't think I've ever heard him say, as it says in the problem of pain or as, you know, I read in mere Christianity, this or that. I don't, I can't remember any, can you Matt, remember? Anything? I don't, I don't remember any specific references now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really wish he would read a lot more C.S. Lewis. And in fact, I wrote a whole article, which is not in the book, but I wrote after the book was done about um, Peterson, who expresses this worry on several occasions uh, that Christianity is too good to be true. And as you know, I'm sure, uh, Lewis has kind of talked about this this worry in, in his own writings. And so in this essay I wrote, I basically kind of highlighted, you know, what Peterson said about this, his problems or his worry, and then showed how Lewis actually has, you know, very deftly, as he as is his want, addressed this very, this very problem. So uh, yeah, as to exactly how much he's read, I don't know. But yeah, if, if I could uh, give him a signed reading, I would <laughs> I would definitely have works of Lewis on there. Yeah, I want to turn up at one of his events with a single volume bound collection of the complete works and just give it to him at the end. Like, just read this, please. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good that would be a good idea. I think the 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 overlap that you see also is, is sort of is just it, it speaks to the the cliche all, all great minds think alike. Uh, one of the things that that I encountered uh, in reading Peterson deeply is he was coming to many of the the same conclusions. All right, I have to be more careful. So, some similar conclusions about the interpretation of Scripture, about the nature of Christ, uh, about the, uh, the 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 possibility of living a meaningful life. That, for example, uh, and as we also see in in in, uh, in Chris's sections of the book, that the church fathers uh, have come to. So I think that 
what we see in Peterson is an open searching, very penetrating mind that will come to similar conclusions that other open searching, penetrating minds come to when they uh, systematically examine these ideas within this particular uh, theological and philosophical context. Well, we'll momentarily dig into the contents of your book, but first, can you tell us what motivated its production? What made you want to write a book about Jordan Peterson and Christianity? Well, I started writing articles about uh, Jordan Peterson and Christianity. So I I wrote an article about uh, his treatment of Adam and Eve. And then I also was very fascinated by his understanding of the Cain and Abel story. And so I kind of went through and I thought, well, you know, I, I kept on going through his, um, basically going through uh, Peterson's interpretation of these stories and seeing how in his interpretation, you find resonances with uh, the interpretation of Augustine or Origen or these other fathers of the church. And then also how various points he was making actually found a firmer foundation in Christian thought. In other words, he would say things like, you know, lying is wrong. Lying is, you know, something that, you know, poisons you and it undermines everything. And I agree with him. I think lying is wrong. Uh, but I never really saw in Peterson a real uh, systematic account of exactly why it's wrong. And and so you do find that, as you know, I'm sure in the Christian tradition, you find people like Augustine of Hippo writing, uh, you know, books. He wrote two different books explicitly on the subject of of lying. And, uh, you know, throughout the tradition, it's a subject that's been quite systematically considered. So, you know, for me, I kind of was already working this. And then um, I forget if we had lunch together, Matt, but we we were talking or something. And and I, I think, I don't know, did I propose? I don't remember. How did it come about? It was, over, it was over a meal. It was, that, okay. That yeah. we were uh, talking about how okay. interesting these overlaps were yeah. between his thought and, but wouldn't it be great if he also yeah. recognized he needed this foundation and this, right. and this end to his work. And so it sort of grew, organically grew out of those conversations. Yeah, and I thought, uh, you know, I had already been working on the biblical part, and I thought, well, Matt could kind of take up the 12 rules for life part of his thought. And then when we were done with the the first draft or the second draft, uh, he came up with this new book, Beyond Order. So then we kind of put together another section of the book about Beyond Order. And so that's sort of how it came about. It kind of, you know, basically I did the first half, he did the second half, and then the third part we collaborated on. So that that's basically the, the structure of it, how how it came about. But it was really nice to work with Matt. Um, I think when you write, when you co-author a book with someone, for me at least, it's always an adventure. You think, oh my gosh, how's this gonna, <laughs> how's this going to turn out? At the end of this argument, we have a fist fight. I mean, <laughs> but we did not have a fist fight. We had a little no. rustling, but no. That, no. Yes, it's, just, it's like no, it was projects at university. There's, 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 are you going to be the one that does all of the work and everyone else takes credit for it? Or is this actually right, exactly split? Exactly. Well, the, the harder problem though, if you co-write a book is, if you end up disagreeing about something, because you can end up, you know, butting heads and it can turn into a, a prolonged conflict if you don't, you know, see things on the same uh, on the same page. So, but thankfully, in this case, whenever we disagreed, Matt always said, oh, yes, of course. I you're submit, totally, I submit. You're, Uncle. You're, Uncle. you're totally right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we, <laughs> I don't, I don't remember if we had, I don't remember having any at least serious. I don't, I'm sure we didn't have serious disagreements, but I don't, I don't even remember. I don't remember. Yeah. So it was a very, very pleasant collaboration. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about the contents of your book, Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity, The Search for a Meaningful Life. When I got my copy, I read the foreword by Bishop Barron and then looked at the two sections. And in the first part, Dr. Kesor, you write a Christian response to the biblical series. And this is the famous series of lectures that you've alluded to, in which Peterson talks about the Bible, particularly the, the Torah. Would you mind just telling us a little bit more about that video series, and how does Dr. Peterson read the Bible? Yeah, so the video series, if, if, I'm, if memory serves, is about 12 uh, episodes long. And it goes through basically starting at the very beginning. He spends a whole lecture on the very first line, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And he basically goes through quite uh, systematically the whole uh, book of Genesis, and he'll focus his interpretation, as I said, primarily on what the church fathers would call the moral reading of Scripture. So he's not trying to give what might be called the literal meaning of Scripture. In other words, what was the original author intending to communicate to the original audience in the book of Genesis? 
So Peterson doesn't, uh, you know, pretend to be a biblical scholar. He's not an expert in the original languages or in the original cultures. So he's not really trying to tease out as a, uh, a b biblical scholar would the kind of nuances of the original languages and original cultures. He's just not doing that. And that's fine. He doesn't, he doesn't need to do that. What he is trying to do is look at those stories and try to think about them in terms of what he would call the psychological meaning. So let's take one of the stories, the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, in one sense, you can bracket the question of whether there really were two brothers, right? Was there really a Cain and an Abel? You know, did one kill the other? Maybe yes, maybe no. Peterson's not really so concerned with that. He's more concerned to see the story as exemplifying archetypes. And so what are the archetypes there? Well, you have the archetypes of rival brothers. And this is an archetype. Why? Because this is a, a universal and recurring theme in the human experience, right? Almost every family can talk about conflicts between siblings, right? Mom liked you best. Dad gave you the car. I can't believe, you know, they paid for you to go to Yale and they'd only pay for me to go to Boston College. I'm, you know, really upset. And I mean, this is right. I mean, everybody pretty much who has a sibling has this sort of thing. And even if you don't have a sibling, it still is, is universal because it's really a story, I think, and in Peterson's interpretation, a story about comparison, right? When you look at somebody else and you, you say, oh, I'm jealous. They have this. They have that. Oh, I wish I had whatever they have. And how do you react to feeling inferior? Or how do you react to social comparisons in which you feel you don't measure up? Well, that is totally universal, right? I mean, there's no one, I think, walking around on planet Earth who can who doesn't compare themselves to others, and at least sometimes compare themselves negatively, right? I'm not as beautiful. I'm not as athletic. I'm not as smart. I'm not as rich. I'm not as whatever it is. How do we react to that? So Peterson, in other words, is reading this classic story and trying to really have insight into these universal, universal truths that are applicable just as much today as they were at the time they were written. And so for me, that's a really fascinating way to approach the biblical stories. Again, not that it's the only way to think about it. I think the church fathers were right. There's different senses of scripture. And so we don't have to limit ourselves just to this one way of reading scripture. But I think the way Peterson's reading it is perfectly legitimate and actually very fruitful. And so I really appreciated what he was doing. And, and, and in my section of the book, what I was trying to do is uh, show how his reading of scripture was actually grounded in this Christian tradition, of which Peterson seemed to be not very aware, uh, show how Peterson's understanding of scripture actually is augmented and completed in the Christian tradition. So in other words, someone who is sympathetic to Peterson's views, uh, I hope if they read our book would see that Peterson's own project actually finds a completion in Christianity. The good parts of what he's saying find a, a better grounding and a more adequate uh, understanding within the Christian tradition. So that's sort of what I was up to in, in my section of the book. And I think the very fact that he can speak so much about the moral sense of scripture, and that's still only one of the four key senses that particularly the early church fathers and the medievals would identify, it shows you how rich a book he's digging into. You know, you haven't even begun placing the, these, these stories in the, in the story of Christ. Uh, pointing you towards heaven and and uh, the the reward beyond, and it, it is it is just it is just amazing the fact that someone can speak so long about just one single sense of scripture. Yeah, and that's actually a way where Peterson and the Christian tradition overlap. In other words, he, Peterson says on a number of occasions that that the Bible has an almost infinite depth of meaning. And uh, people like Thomas Aquinas 100% agree. He said that uh, because the Bible is the word of God, he said even one word has a kind of infinite meaning because God's mind is infinite, God's intention is infinite. So even just a single word of scripture has a kind of infinity of meaning to it because ultimately it has a human author, but it also has a divine author. And so, you know, the, the idea that scripture is this deep, rich, incredibly important text. If that idea uh, alone is what Peter, what people get from Peterson's work, I think they've gotten something extremely valuable because it's a powerful antidote to the kind of casual dismissal of the Bible as just, you know, old folk tales and, oh, this is just so silly and these poor benighted people, they used to think this and that, how silly and stupid, we're way beyond them now. Well, I think Peterson demonstrates in a very powerful way that this casual dismissal of scripture as meaningless is uh, not going to stand up to scrutiny. 
And in your book, you talk through Peterson's view of creation and fall. And you also have a chapter entitled Chaos Utopia and the Divine Call to Adventure. What do you talk about there? So that chapter talks in particular about the call of Abraham. So Abraham leaves his comfortable home. And according to the story, he was already an old man. So picture you know, maybe if we put it in today's terms, some, you know, 38-year-old guy in the basement of his parents' house playing video games all day and drinking beer and just, you uh, know. I've seen that working. movie. It's called Failure to Launch. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, the first version of it was uh, was Abraham. I mean, he just was, <laughs> he was in his, his father's tent and just not doing much. And God calls him to this great adventure. God calls him uh, and promises him that he'll be the father of a great nation. And, you know, it's a famous story where, you know, his wife is old and, you know, sterile. And so he takes another wife and all kinds of chaos breaks out from that. Uh, but in a way, I think the story of Abraham is a powerful uh, demonstration of the fidelity of God to his promises. Because if you think about all the ancient peoples that are talked about in in uh, in the Bible, you know, the Hittites and the uh, Jebusites and all, you know, uh, the Philistines, all these people... I don't have any Philistines living next door to me. Well, that's actually not true. No. I do have, but not. <laughs> You're at a university. <laughs> you must have them all around. Exactly. I mean, not in the original sense of Philistines. I mean, <laughs> yes, I do sort of, but but very very few Hittites, you know, living right by me, and uh, you know, so but but there are. I have Jewish friends, so there's clearly Jewish people all over the place, and the, it reminds me of Pas- Blaise Pascal's famous response to the King of France. He said, "The King of France asked Blaise Pascal." Uh, prove to me that God exists in two words. And Pascal replied, the Jews, right? The idea is that it is uh, evidence of God's providential care that there are more than half of the planet now calls Abraham their father. Certainly all Jews do, but also Christians and Muslims call Abraham their father in faith. At, At the Catholic liturgy, it's part of the liturgy to call Abraham the father of faith. So, you know, he has these children now, uh, more than half of planet Earth. And that's sort of an amazing, amazing thing. Um, And it actually reminds me of another amazing thing, where in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Mary says, all generations will call me blessed. And you think it's literally true today. There are millions and millions of times today that people will call Mary blessed. All over the world, different languages, different, you know, cultures, Literally all over the world today, there's millions of people doing that. So it's it's a it's a powerful uh, proof, I would say, of God's uh, faithful promises. Now we'll talk about part two in a moment, but there was one other question I had about this first part because in the final chapter, it's got a title which should be familiar to most of our listeners. Uh, you, you entitled it "Myth Become Fact," which is very similar to a title of an essay that Lewis included ultimately in "God in the Dock." What do you make of Jordan Peterson's understanding of myth? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think Jordan Peterson thinks about myth as a story that has a very, very deep truth, but a truth that couldn't be adequately conveyed, say, by a New York Times reportage on you know some contemporary event. In other words, it's not a truth that if you had television cameras there, you know, recording the event, the event would, uh, or the cameras would pick up. So he talks about it, myth as containing truths that are deeper than the everyday newspaper uh, kind of truth. And I think Lewis would agree with that, but but say that that fact doesn't exclude the possibility of there being myths that actually are truth in the newspaper sense of the term. In other words, on Lewis's view, of course, if the resurrection of Jesus is archetypal, it is about the universal hope of all people that death is not the final word. But it's more than that. It's actually a fact that ha- actually actually happened, right? That's the whole idea of uh, the good news. And so when you have, for example, in the Gospels, uh, women being the first witnesses of the resurrection, and the story says, you know, that Mary Magdalene, for instance, was, uh, you know, there at the tomb early in the morning and saw him. I think that that's significant because in a way that indicates for me that it's not merely mythic. Why? Well, because if you were trying to um, have a mythic story in the ancient world, the most credible witnesses that you would put forward would not be women, because in the ancient world, at least, women were not considered reliable eyewitnesses, and they couldn't uh, testify in court and things like that. 
So you have these kind of historical details that point to a story that is not a mere myth, but rather has an historical credibility to it. Hmm. Now, Dr. Petrusik, you wrote the second part of the book where you offer a response to Dr. Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life. Um, would you mind just first of all explaining what that book is about? It's important to keep in mind with, with Peterson, specifically even when we're looking at that book, that he's also a, a, a clinical psychologist. I don't know if he still practices anymore. Uh, but as he was as he was teaching, as he was writing his, his, his articles and his first book, he was also seeing patients. And, and so I think the, the first, the first most literal reading of 12 rules for 12 rules for life is that these are rules to help keep you from your life descending into chaos and despair, uh, in, in a clinical sense. And, and a lot of it is based upon the kinds of breakdowns he's seen in the individuals that he's, that he's helped over the years. And, and occasionally in the book, he'll even reference, uh, patients, of course, uh, anonymously, uh, so there is that that therapeutic dimension to it, and I don't I don't say that with my tongue in my cheek because you know therapy can also be part of the problem, um, but I think he's genuinely interested in helping people to live uh, more fulfilling, more meaningful, or at least less uh, despairing lives. Uh, but I think that's that's the surface level. The the deeper level is he's trying to look at some paradigmatic rules, his own 10 commandments, as it were, around which you can build any a whole system of meaning uh, and value. And I think that that book has some success, uh, limited success, but real success in, in building out that, that system of what that might look like if you read all the rules together. Mm. And you begin by considering Peterson's theology and philosophy. How would you describe it? Uh, one way that I, I've done it sort of from within the Christian tradition is looking at the story of uh, St. Augustine prior to his, his own conversion. Um, St. Augustine, of course, has, is a, a genius, has a, a penetrating mind, uh, but did was not ready to convert until he had basically tried all of these other <laughs> systems of thought and uh, looked at them sort of from the inside. I think that's one of the virtues of Peterson is he, he will look at a system of thought from within the inside and examine it and then critique it uh, and then if necessary, move on to something else. I think that's, that's part of the reason he's been led to, uh, been led to Christianity. Uh, and so there, there's a kind of uh, philosophical uh, rigor to his work. I do think it, it needs to be more systematized in order, as, as Chris already noted, in order to be complete and have an, an adequate uh, adequate philosophical foundation, but it also points beyond itself to these ultimate these 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 ultimate pillars of uh, of what life is fundamentally about, what it's for, and uh, whether in fact there there is a God that that makes it all possible and, and brings it all to its final conclusion. Uh, and so I don't want to just limit it to the to the philosophical realm within his thought. I think there is there might even be a, a a nascent, uh, but 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 still present, a mystical dimension to his thought in the sense that he's he's really he's really genuinely interested in in ultimate questions beyond just their strict strictly philosophical uh, meaning. Mm. And you consider various problems which he identifies. Uh, the first problem being meaning and its pursuit. Uh, what is the problem there? Well, the uh, the the way that I I chose to organize the book by by putting it around problems because I was just trying to create a, to use a fancy, but I think helpful word, a hermeneutic of Peterson. How do you read Peterson uh, beyond that level of just uh, uh, rules for trying to structure your life, uh, a self-help book? How do we read this beyond the self-help book level? And so I, I noticed, you know, reading it first time and second time, uh, and then, you know, looking at sections at, at that level, uh, that there, he appears to be working on some fundamental problems here, and that these rules are not just discrete rules, but are are grouped around. Uh, we could even say archetypal archetypical uh, problems, and one of them is the problem of meaning. And so the the kind of pattern of that section of the book is to say, look, look at all these great insights that he has. Look at how these great insights he ha that he has actually correspond, sometimes directly, sometimes closely, with things that the church fathers, especially Augustine and Aquinas, uh, have already argued. And look at how Augustine and Aquinas and, and the, the, the Christian tradition broadly actually solve the, the messiness or the inconsistencies or the gaps in Peterson's thought. So that's the, that's the sort of the, the basic structure of each chapter. Look for the connections, 
uh, explain the connections and look for how actually the Christian tradition solves problems that Peterson thought isn't able to solve. Mm. So the next problem in the words of the Princess Bride is love, true love. Uh, <laughs> so what is the problem that, with true love? Well, I think what one, one thing that, that Peterson gets absolutely right is he, he takes away the sort of the, 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 the superficial sense of love as being a kind of positive feeling or attraction to another and, and even deeper than that, identifies love as, uh, as for example, as, as Aquinas puts it, as a kind of, ob- you're seeking the objective good of the other, not what they want, not what they think that they want, not even what you want, but what is truly and objectively good for them. Uh, and I think that that is, to, to contemporary years, that's, a, that's sort of a revolutionary statement that love could mean something that you don't want, or, lo- or, or you could act... You could tell somebody something that they don't want to hear because you love them uh, is, is, is difficult for uh, the, secular, the secular mind to, um, to accept. But Peterson goes there, and he goes there quite directly, and I think a lot of his rules are directed towards uh, retraining the, 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 con- the contemporary culture to see love as an objective good to be pursued rather than some kind of subjective feeling. The issue there, of course, is is love needs a, a source and, and a summit. So if he gets the principle right that you, that love means objectively seeking the good of seeking the objective good of the other, we need content to what that good is, and then we need a source of what that good is, and then we need to know what that good is for. Uh, I would recommend to the listeners that's a really good chapter to go to if you just want to jump in and take one chapter because this season we've read through the four loves, so it was it was ticking many boxes of things that we've spoken about already this season. Now, in our remaining time, I want to know what's happened since you wrote the book, because you've obviously spoken to lots of different people about Dr. Peterson, including Pope Francis, and you've even been on Peterson's show. So have your thoughts changed at all, or maybe developed? Yeah, I would say uh, my thoughts have developed in the sense that I, after the book came out, I ran across, I'm not sure if he had done this, he may have produced this content after the book was already done, or I may have just not seen it. But anyway, I ran across content of his about uh, Christianity as wishful thinking. And so I wrote this essay uh, using Lewis, as I mentioned earlier, directly responding to this concern. And part of what I what I saw in that is that this is an example of the genetic fallacy. So the genetic fallacy is where you judge a belief as true or false based on the genesis or origin of the belief. So let's say um, you critique someone's view because you say, well, you... You want this to be the case, and therefore it's it's false. But that kind of critique clearly doesn't work, right? Because yes, is it true that Christians hope their beliefs are true? Well, yes, of course. But it's also true that atheists hope their beliefs are true, right? Thomas Nagel has said famously, I don't want there to be a God. I hope that the universe isn't like that. So you can't judge a belief as true or false based on whether an individual espousing the beliefs hopes it's true or not, because then you'd have say, both God existing and also not existing, <laughs> right? Since some people hope that God exists and some people hope that God doesn't exist. So that that obviously is not going to work very well. And so Lewis is very good on this point that if you want to know whether a belief is true or false, we can't look to the genesis of the belief. We can't look at the internal desires of the belief. Um, you know, I desire to have a big bank account was his uh, example. And so if I believe that is true, you don't disprove it by saying, well, you believe you have a, a lot of money in your bank account, therefore you don't. You'd have to look at the arithmetic and look at the math and check the books, and maybe your belief is justified. You have a lot of money in your bank account, or maybe it's not. But the belief isn't disproven by the fact that you hope that you have money in your bank. Um, so anyway, that's something that I, I wish I had discovered before uh, and had been able to put in the book. I try to keep up with what Peterson does, but frankly, I can't totally do that because he puts out yeah. just tons, so much content that... Uh, I think even the most devoted fan of Peterson can't quite stay totally on top of it. But to the degree that I can, I try to stay up on top of things. I noticed that he was suspended from Twitter. So I used to check his Twitter, but now that's, you know, I don't do that anymore. So anyway, that's, that's where I am with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the other foot to drop with Peterson. And I honestly, I don't know if it, if it will. And what I mean by that is, is he's, he's come so close to the cusp of, uh, I think even sort of biographically in the own story of his own life in terms of what his, his experience with his wife and now with his daughter, 
uh, of uh, of seeing that it's it's sort of there's an either or there, you know, to, to draw on Kierkegaard a little bit that, you know, e either I'm going to make a commitment or I'm not going to make a commitment. And and I think that the the sort of his compromise right now, as far as I understand it, is is to to equivocate on what belief means hmm. as if like, how could I possibly believe in God? Because, again, as I understand it and I'm not sure I do understand it, but it seems to be that if I say yes to the question, I believe in God. Uh, I, it's, it's sort of a, a, on the one hand, it's a, it's a blasphemy because how could you possibly believe in God and God is real? On the other hand, it would commit me to a way of life that I can't possibly, uh, possibly, uh, abide by because it's, it's calling us to moral, not only moral excellence, but moral perfection. <laughs> and I think, you know, that's a great, that's a great point I, as, as far as it goes uh, theologically, but there's, there's answers to that like mm -hmm. literally within the Bible. So, so <laughs> just, I, just, just I, read I, a few books further, further down, particularly in the New exactly, Testament. Exactly. Like spend some time with St. Paul. Um, and, and so I don't, I don't know how he's going to resolve because it can't be, it can't be, it, it, it can't just be left hanging there. I don't know how you live that even psychologically mm -hmm. speaking. I don't know how you live in that gray zone indefinitely, especially if, if, and well, when there's going to be another sort of great trial that, that, that happens in life as happens to all of us and it has happened to him, uh, into, in, in spades in terms mm -hmm. of the kinds of suffering that he's gone through. So I don't know. I really don't know if he's going to make a commitment or not, but I, I'm not within the holding pattern with him anymore. <laughs> if mm -hmm. it, if it, when it happens, <laughs> I, I hope it does for, for, for his sake, uh, uh, I'll be happy, but I, I think he's sort of frozen right now intellectually. And, and theologically because of that. It's yet another reason why he needs to read more Lewis, because this is this is walking through mere Christianity after yes. you realize that there is a law that you cannot keep and you keep breaking, and that there is a lawgiver whom you offend in this. Just just keep turning the pages because the lawgiver provides a solution. That's right. <laughs> right. Keep reading, as you say. And in your interview with him, you spoke about grace. And this, this does seem to be a concept that just doesn't seem to feature in his thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think his, um, his thought in a way is kind of um, Kantian. And what I mean by that is it's very much focused on the ethical. And there's something, you know, very strong and positive in Kant's focus on the ethical. But I think that that really a life of faith is is not simply about the rules, right? It's it's much more about a relationship, and I don't think that's quite on his radar yet. I mean, in other words, to live to live as if God exists, which he's trying to do. I have total respect for that, and I try to do that too. But I think even more importantly than living by the rules is trying to live in a relationship of love with God and with other people. And in a way, that makes better sense of the rules anyway, right? Because the rules are only uh, extensions, as it were, of authentically loving God and authentically loving other people. So I hope that he, in, in, a, in a way, intensifies his efforts to live as if God exists. Because I think if you do that, the next question you're going to ask is, well, if God exists, has God said anything about how to live? Has God revealed himself at all? And then Peterson seems to kind of answer that question like, yes, Jesus of Nazareth is in some way God's revelation, is the Son of God, is the Logos. I mean, he kind of says stuff like that. So then you say, okay, well, what does Jesus of Nazareth have to teach us about how to live? Well, it seems that he told his disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He told his disciples at the Last Supper to do this in memory of me, to, to have the Eucharistic meal. And so, you know, I think that if you follow out his, his initial premise that I'm going to live as if God exists and then I'm going to try to follow the Jesus of Nazareth, it seems like that train pulls into the station of I have to find a church where I can be baptized and where I can receive the Eucharist. Yeah. So I, 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 for me, at least, it seems to, to pretty directly follow from something he's already embraced. Hmm. There's a line in one of Lewis's letters where he talks about effectively taking the plunge. And he says that sometimes you have to become a disciple. Uh, before you become, you know, a proficient theologian, uh, and I, I, I sent I sent that quotation to one of my friends who was teetering on the edge of completing RCIA and being baptized because he wanted to understand everything, and yeah. just taking the first step of living that life and moving forward made all of the difference because otherwise I can see you just getting stuck in analysis paralysis. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. And I think if if you really wanted to understand everything, uh, I don't think you would ever do anything. So uh, just to put a, a theology aside, I'm not going to get married till I understand everything about my wife <laughs> and everything about... Uh, okay, you're just not getting married. I'm not going to have kids <laughs> until I fully understand the ramifications of having kids and, you know, you're never going to have kids, right? I mean, part of living a full life, it seems to me, is taking a venture of faith, right? Meeting a fantastic person and saying, you know what? I'm committing myself to you and we're going to move forward in life. And I don't know exactly what that entails, but I'm with you in good times and in bad and sickness and in health. And we're going to move forward in love. And, and you know, there'll be questions along the way. Of course there will be, right? I mean, how could you expect to, to live a human life and say, well, I've had all my questions answered. I know everything. Now I'm ready to live. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. I mean, you would never do anything. You'd never live. So that's anyway, right. I, I, I hope he doesn't get into this uh, paralysis where, you know, until every last question is, is thoroughly answered, you're just kind of stuck in neutral. Because in fact, you can't really be stuck in neutral. What I mean is you have to live, right, as if God exists or not. Yeah. And you have to live as if Jesus really is God or not. And you have to live as if we should be members of a church or not, right? You have to get up on Sunday and either go to church or you don't. So in other words, there are these binary choices where mere agnosticism is not an option. And you have to actually choose either to, you know, pray, read the Bible, make time for God, all these things that you could do, or you choose to live as if God doesn't exist. But just being neutral is a fine theoretical perspective, but in terms of living is not really an option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also a, 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 a tension that I think it's, it's an ironic tension. And I think uh, Peterson kind of represents that uh, more, more generally in the culture is that on the one hand, and we see this all in all the statistics, you know, people are in the West are, are, are pouring out of organized religion. And that includes within Catholicism as well. The, the, the sad statistic, right, is that for every person who joins, six leaves. So there's this exodus from religion on the one hand. Uh, and it's for when you actually dig into uh, the reasons, it's usually for, and I don't mean to, to say that these are superficial reasons in the sense that their experience is superficial or that it's done easily, but the actual intellectual content of the reasons is usually very superficial. Like it gets, I, I choose science over faith or uh, I don't believe in, in, in rules or something like that. Sometimes, you know, even self-contradictory reasons. Uh, so you have that happening culturally. And at the same time, I think this is a golden age of apologetics, both in the production of apologetics and in the distribution of apologetics. I, I can't think of a time when there's been more resources to answer questions in a systematic and intellectually satisfying way, including questions about the divinity of Jesus Christ and the possibility of life after death and the uh, and the uh, then you know as you get within more in the tradition and the Eucharist actually being the the real presence. I mean, there you can access all that information instantly and for free. And so there's this kind of false sense in which there are all these questions of faith. And I guess I'm, do I have, do I take the plunge or not take the plunge? And I have to sort of <laughs> abandon my intellectual rigor to do so. And it's just, it's just not the case, especially now. Uh, and so I would also hope, I don't know how realistic is this, that Peterson would engage some apologetics, some serious apologetics with, with the questions about for example, divinity of Christ as a as a, as a, a literal statement about Christ, mm. and it, it was funny when you, you talk about taking taking the plunge because it made me think of the Pilgrim's Regress, which the the turning point is when the Pilgrim in Lewis's story uh, lets go and dives, and it's only in that process of of letting go that he discovers how to view everything rightly. Yeah. Um, but, but again, we're, 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 back to, we're back to grace. <laughs> well, as our landlord rings the bell for final drinks, would you mind letting our listeners know where they can go to find out more about each of you and pick up a copy of your book, Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity and the Search for a Meaningful Life? Well, I think the book is available at uh, wordonfire.org. Uh, if they go there, they can search for that. And also our information about both of us is, is actually available also there. And I think we're, we're, yeah, we're both on Twitter too. So uh, I think my Twitter handle is professor underscore Kayser, prof Kayser. And I forget what yours is. What is yours? I think it's just my name. It's just your name. <laughs> well, I would have preferred to have just my name, but, but, you know, I, I think my name's kind of unusual, my last name at least, but it was all taken. So I thought, well, I'll have to go with that. So anyway. Did you um, try and track down who this other person is? <laughs> 
Well, well, there's a bunch. There's like, you know, Chris Kayser was taken and Christopher Kayser was taken. I just kept trying. And then I didn't want to be Christopher, you know, dot snap, snappy dog or whatever. But, <laughs> you know, that was taken. So I, I kept on anyway. So I, I settled with that boring one. <laughs> well, I will track them down for certain and I'll put them in the show notes so people can just go there. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thanks again for both of you coming on the show. And thanks to all of our listeners for listening along. Thanks to our patron supporters, particularly our top tier supporters, Erica, Marvin, Joelle, Angela, Deborah, one and two, Amanda, Thomas, Anonymous, Bill, Joanna, Snort, Bud, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian, Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David, and Rowdy. If you enjoy this episode, please share it with a friend who loves Jordan Peterson. And even if they don't. <laughs> the next two episodes will be interviews conducted by Andrew. And then after that, we will have our season finale. So please join us then. When we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. 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 Cheers.